All right, so um, we'll continue our discussion on latent variable models. Just wanted to remind everyone last time we did an introduction, motivated why latent variable models are useful, what are latent variable models, and essentially how does it connect to graphical models we learned before. Well, with that, then we motivated the challenges of maximal likelihood estimators for a latent variable model. Uh, namely Gaussian mixtures, I oh, showed you why it is challenging and what are the challenges. Uh, so with that motivation, with that motivation, now um, we're ready to introduce the method of moments. Um, in order to understand it, we need to prepare ourselves, uh, ourselves with some tensor notations. Um, okay. Oh, is someone in the waiting room? Okay. All right. Very noisy, but people are jumping in. Good. Okay. So let's continue here. Okay. So, you know, we saw this slide last time, and I said this was the very important slide. Uh, let's review it again, so, you know, since it's been a few days from the last lecture. So method of moments at a glance, uh, we have three steps. First step is to de determine function of model parameters, theta, which is estimatable from observable data. So how you determine it is not through some estimation, but through a analytical analysis of the form of the function which is a function dependent on theta, okay? So last time we said something like if f, um, if we're assuming that x is coming from a Gaussian distribution and we use f as an identity, so it's just expectation of x, so then it should be characterized using the mean of the Gaussian distribution. And in this scenario, it's just mu. Right, which is a function of theta because theta includes both mu and the covariance matrix uh, th sigma. Is this clear? So what I, I'm trying to say here is that when you f you when you choose a certain f, as long as your f is fixed, then you should be able to analytically write the expectation in terms of a function of pro model parameters theta because you know exactly what is the underlying model you are using, okay? Although there might be model misspecification, misspecification because you don't know what's the underlying model, but you know, condition on that this data is generated from that underlying model, you know what's the form of the moments, okay? So this is like the parametric method, right? As some of you uh, who might be, some of you might be familiar with the parametric method. So that's the first bullet point um, is now, you know, using the moments, you're getting an estimation uh, of the moments using the model parameters. You, you're getting a formula of the uh, moments using the model parameters. So now the second bullet point is forming estimates of the moments using data, using the IID examples, right? So you have the empirical moments uh, which is denoted as the uh, expectation, the hat of the expectation of some fx. Again, you know, if you use the same f as in bullet point one, then here is the third bullet point. You can just do moment matching, right? You can just set, you know, the analytical formula, which is a function of theta, to be equal to the empirical estimate of that moment for the same F, okay? So, so, so far so good. Now, yeah, please feel free to interrupt if you do have a question. Well, so now until this point, it seems like I've finished covering, you know, the three bully points, but I still haven't really talked about the function F here, okay? So, 
I just hinted that, you know, I can choose F to be an identity. This becomes a first order moment. Or I can choose F to be something like a second order interaction between the data, or you can think about it as a second order correlation. Um, or, you know, think about covariance is, is something like a second order uh, interaction. Um, and now I could actually think about even higher order interactions between the data. So an extension of the covariance would be a third order interaction. And by using tensor notations, we will understand how to write it concretely and how to understand it concretely. Right now, you know, we don't know how to do that yet. Okay, so now here comes the real interesting question. How should I choose F, right? You know, should I choose F to be first order, second order, third order, or even higher order? And why would that matter? So I don't know if any of you, you know, have some knowledge about um, um, method moments, but if you do, and you know the answer, you know, maybe you could speak up. Um, okay, that's fine. So I'm just curious in case, you know, some of you are already very familiar with method moments. So, so this really comes to this question, uh, this equation here. Um, I don't know if you can see my cursor. Can you? Yes. Oh, you can? Okay. Oh, I have a spotlight. Awesome. Okay, here. Um, right. So it really comes to the question here, sorry, really comes to the equation here, right? So looking at this equation, the question is, if you use F to be as simple as possible, like a first order um, interaction, you know, which basically means that F is just identity. So it's just expectation theta of X itself and equals to the hat of the expectation of X. Right? So if you look at a simple F, the question is, by solving this equation, can you uniquely identify the model parameters theta? OK. So is this clear? So let me say that again. This is very important. So the problem really comes to whether you can use a simple F to completely characterize theta by solving this equation under a simple F. Okay, so now let's, let's think about a very simple example here. I'm going to stop sharing and I'll share from my iPad. Can you see it? I think you can. Okay, wonderful. All right, so last time we talked about in Gaussian example. Okay, let's assume X from some Gaussian distribution. Okay. So then basically my theta is the pair mu and sigma here, right? Mu is the mean and sigma is the covariance matrix of my Gaussian. So, so this is my sigma going back to my notation in my slides. This is denoting the model parameter. Okay, well, so now I'm gonna ask you, right? Before we said we wanted to match this guy here, right? So I'm just writing it again here. So I'm gonna ask you this question, right? First, let's think about a simple 
fx equals to x. So this is the first order thing. So in, indeed, the f theta of fx would be this one. So it's a first order moment. OK, and under this scenario, we can also see that this is a first order empirical moment. OK. All right, so now under this choice, how are you going to do moment matching? So first of all, I'm going to ask you, what is the first order for a Gaussian? Sorry, what's the first order moment for Gaussian? Yuanling said mu. Do people agree? Yes. Uh, I wanted to see more responses because this seems to be something really okay. Okay. So, is there any other opinion? Or, you know, is there anything that's unclear? I would like to clarify that. Yeah, that's, that's true. You know, the answer is just mu because, you know, it's just mu, right? In the moment, the expectation of x, if x is the Gaussian, and then that's just mu. So basically, my moment matching equation here just becomes mu equals to, so what's the right-hand side? What's the first order empirical moment for Gaussian or for anything? Right? Assuming that x sub i is just the i example and you have m examples in your training data set, then this is just that. Okay? Sample average, exactly. That is sample average. That is also the first order uh, empirical moment. Okay, so now I'm going to ask you. If your choice is simply that fx equals to x, this is the equation you're getting. Do you agree? So now with that equation, can you uniquely identify the model parameter? Notice that model parameter is mu and sigma. First of all, can you uniquely identify mu? Yes, right? Assuming that n, you know, m, sorry, m goes to infinity, then sure. Actually, in my slides, I used n, so let me just be consistent and use n here as well. Okay. Um, yeah, exactly. So now my question is, can you uniquely identify sigma, right? Because my theta includes both my mu and my sigma. Can you uniquely identify my sigma using just f equals to x, fx equals to x? Apparently not, right? because you don't have any information about your theta uh, sigma here. You only have your information about your mu. So what does that mean? That means you need a slightly more complicated fx equals to x. So if x is a vector, a column vector, then this is x, x transpose. Okay, so this is also called
second order moment, as you can see, I'm looking at the interaction of the data, right? A second order interaction, a relationship within the data. Okay, so now my question is, what is your moment matching? How are you doing moment matching? Using this fx equals to xx transpose. Oh, what happened? Oops. Okay. Yeah, how do we do that? Right? This is how we're doing the matching. Okay, so now my question is, was this f x equals to x as well as f x equals to x x transpose? Now can you uniquely identify a Gaussian distribution? Can you uniquely identify mu and sigma? Yes, right? That is very obvious. So now, you know, this is a very simple example. I'm using Gaussian here. Now the question is, if you have a latent variable model because you have some latent variable there, can you still get this very nice result that you can use relatively simple F to do moment matching, right? Can you use lower order? In other words, can you use lower order moment matching to uniquely identify your model parameter? Right? So the answer is, even for mixture of Gaussian, something like as simple as mixture of Gaussian, you cannot use a second order. But the good news is, if you use a third order, so we haven't introduced how to understand the third order yet, but you can think about it as an extension of a pairwise relationship to a triplewise relationship. So something like expectation of the triplewise relationship between the x, but if you haven't learned about tensor notations, this seems to be something you don't know how to write it out concretely, okay? So now this motivates us to think about how, you know, we, we can use tensors and how we can use, you know, extensions of two-dimensional arrays to multi-dimensional arrays, okay? Is that clear? If so, I can just switch back to my slides. So this is my explanation about the method moments at a glance. I'm using a very simple um, you know, example, which is just a Gaussian uh, identification. Um, seems like you can use first, second order moments, right? First and second order moments to uniquely identify the model parameters using moment matching, okay? So now we wanted to look at more complicated models so the question really is how complicated we need F to be? And that's the key here. So let me go back to my slides now. Okay. All right. I hope we can still see the slides. Um, let me also bring out my spotlight. Okay. So what is a tensor? Right, um, tensor, like I said, is a multi-dimensional array. And here is a third order tensor. So the order means, you know, the number of dimension, right? So notice that not to confuse with, you know, the size of the tensor. In this case, the size of the tensor is I by J by K, because, you know, this direction, you have I elements, uh, your, your dimensionality is I, and this direction, your dimensionality is J. And this direction, your dimensionality is k. So the size will be i by j by k. But the order is three, because you have three dimensions. OK, so a matrix is a second order tensor, because it has two dimensions. right? If the matrix is i by j, though, it means you have i rows and j columns. Similarly, here it could be i by j by k. So, you know, this is the size of your tensor, a third order tensor. Okay, of course, I don't know how to illustrate a fourth order or even a higher order tensor, but you can imagine as just a multi dimensional array. Okay, it's just that I don't know how to visualize it. Okay, 
So now I wanted to introduce something very, very important. Um, so don't, uh, I think this slide is again, a very, very important slide. This is the tensor product. And now this will tell us how we can, you know, think about a more complicated F. The F meaning like the one when I was talking about the um, method of moments at a glance, so the F here. So how we can think about a triple wise relationship of F. And now this is the answer. We're going to use a tensor product. So what is a tensor product? A tensor product is something that is characterizing a multi, um, how to say? Yeah, so triple wise, so pairwise or triple wise relationship or even higher, uh, you know, order relationship. So let me first look at this case here on the left hand side, right? So I'm denoting this as a, so this thing is the tensor product notation. So if I, if I have an A vector, right? So A vector, this is my A vector and my B vector here. If I do this, so the A tensor product with B will give me a matrix. So if A has, you know, uh, if the length of A is I and the length of J is J, oh, sorry, if the length of A is I and the length of B is J, then this resulting matrix will be I by J. And now let's look at the I1 and I2 entry in that matrix. So, you know, this resulting matrix I1, I2's entry, so this is the I1, I2's entry. How is it defined? It's defined as the I1's entry of the A multiplied with the I2's entry of B. So this is how you understand, you know, the pairwise relationship. The I1, I2's element of the resulting matrix is a pairwise relationship between the I1's entry in A and I2's entry in B. That's why it's a pairwise relationship. Okay. Also, you know, by definition, mathematically, we know that this matrix will definitely be rank one because it is a tensor product of two vector. And this is definition of rank one, essentially, right? If a matrix is rank one, then it can be written as a tensor product or an outer product. Some of you are more familiar with outer product uh, between two vectors. Okay, so any questions here? So this is using a matrix that we're more familiar with to introduce this tensor product. And sometimes you call it outer product, okay, between vectors. So now you can imagine if I replace my A and B with my X, then I can just, you know, think of the X, tensor product X as what? as x, x transpose, right? This is exactly x, x transpose, if you think about it, okay? And x, x transpose is, is exactly, you know, what we called a second order moment. Expectation of x, x transpose is just a second order moment, okay? Okay, I hope this is clear. Well, now let's extend to tensor. Right, so now with tensor, now we're looking at a third order tensor. So it means we have three vectors. You know, we're looking at the triple wise relationship between three vectors. So what is it? You have vector A here, vector B here, and vector C here. Okay, so A tensor B tensor C will give you a tensor. So this will be a third order tensor because it has three direction, you know, three dimensions. It's a three dimensional uh, array, okay? So it will also be rank one, and this is indeed the mathematical definition of rank one third order tensor, right? Because, you know, if a tensor is rank one, then it can be written as an outer product of multiple vectors, 
Okay, so this is the definition of the rank one tensor. This will be a rank one tensor. So the rank one tensor, again, you know, if the dimension of A is I, dimension of B is J, uh, uh, dimension C is K, then the dimension of the resulting tensor will be I by J by K. The size will be I by J by K, okay? This is very similar to the matrix here. So now, you know, as I said, it will be a third order tensor. So looking at the entry, I1, I2, I3's entry of that third order tensor. So here, right, this is I1, so I1 is one, I2 is three, and I3 is one. So one, three, one, okay? So that means it's gonna be the first entry of the A and the third entry of B and the first entry of C multiplication, okay? Okay, so now, you know, of course you can imagine if I replace A with X, B with X and C with X as well, then I'm getting X tensor X tensor X and this will essentially characterizing a triple wise correlation within my data. And if I take an expectation of this, then this will become a third order moment. So my F can indeed be more complicated than XX transpose, which is a second order moment. My F can be something, you know, higher order moments. And I can use this tensor product, or you can think of it as an outer product to denote these higher order relationships. Is this clear? Okay, awesome. Okay, uh, let me see the chat. Okay. Uh, is there a question? Uh, um, I think I2 is an arbitrary index for B. Uh, I was replying to Elliot's question above, so I think it's, everything's been answered. Oh, I see, okay. Great, great, great. I think that's fine. Okay, awesome. Okay, so we can continue, right? So now with the tensor product, I wanted to also introduce some, you know, more understanding about the structure of a tensor itself, right? Not only from a math point of view, but now from a point of trying to understand the shape of tensors. So for a third order tensor, uh, let me try. Okay, so for a third order tensor, you know, which is, you know, the major discussion here in this lecture because it is easy for us to visualize. Of course, all we're talking about can be easily extend to higher order tensor, but especially for a third order tensor, we do have names for the slices, right? So in this case, if you slice the tensor in this way, Right, so then this will be horizontal slices. If you slice the tensor this way, right, it will be lateral slices. And slicing the tensor, you know, this way, <laughs> it's hard to show, but you know, this picture is pretty clear. Is a frontal slice. Okay, so just a different naming for these slicing uh, along different directions. Okay, but you know, you don't have to remember those names is, you know, just interesting to know. So now more importantly, I wanted to introduce the fiber. So the fiber seems to be, um, actually, I think it is even more useful than slices. So think about the fiber as a mode one kind of, you know, collection of uh, series of numbers. So First of all, let's think about matrix. So now you don't have this thing, you only have mode one and mode two fibers. So for matrix, a mode one fiber is just a column, right? Because you don't have the things along that direction. So you don't have all these things here, right? You only have the, 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 the you know, you only have the first frontal slice, you know, that's gonna be your matrix. And for mode one fiber for a matrix is just a column of that matrix, okay? And for mode two fiber of the matrix is just a row of the matrix, right? But 
now because you know you have an extra dimension so you have an extra way of you know denoting the fiber so it's called mode three fiber um so laura is asking if you have a third order moment of x then couldn't you just rotate the resulting tensor so couldn't a third order moment be either oh so that's very interesting that with you know so if you are looking at expectation of x tensor x tensor x this is actually a symmetric tensor so you know i don't have time to cover that but it is all you know clearly written in coda's tensor review paper yeah for those of you who are interested please refer to this paper especially if you plan to do some research along this line, please read this paper. This paper, you know, is, ra is rather long, but it is definitely worth reading. Um, you don't have to read all the sections. You wanted to read the first few sections to understand the basics and the basic notation that people follow in tensors to start, you know, any research in, if you wanted to do in tensors. Okay. Okay. Awesome. All right, so now I'm introducing the fibers. Oh, that's, yeah, that's a good link. Thanks, Yelling. Uh, okay, so now with the, so we've introduced the fibers, right? We've introduced the slices, we've introduced the tensor product. The tensor product is nothing but a, you know, like an outer product. So now we're ready to introduce the decomposition of the tensor. So before that, I wanted to remind everyone a decomposition of matrix, right? So we all know how to do decomposition of a matrix. So if you think about a decomposition of a matrix, actually, I wanted to use, uh, I wanted to use my iPad to write something. So let me stop sharing here, and I'll stop sharing. Mm. think it's worthwhile to review that first. So we'll have a better idea. Okay, um, you can still see my screen, right? Hopefully. Okay. Um, yeah. Oh, isn't properly showing, is it? Um, so, okay, well, sh should I stop then? I think it's showing fine for me because I'm, you know, logging in through two accounts. Okay. Yeah, I think it's showing. So maybe you wanted to check your setting. Okay. So for a matrix decomposition, okay. So for matrix decomposition, um, you know, most of you are more familiar with like the matrix can be written as, you know, uh, let me use a simple notation here. So uh, something like this, but uh, let's say N, right? So uh, let me, consider the simple case that M, so matrix is M by N, okay? So this is a matrix decomposition. Okay, I hope everyone's okay with that. So now I'm gonna actually write it in terms of tensor product or vector outer product. Can I do it? First of all, I'm gonna ask if my sigmas are all greater So what is the rank of my matrix? N, right? Why is it N? Remember the formal, the mathematical formal definition of rank? Rank just means that the minimal number that you can write, you know, the, the minimal number of summation terms um, of these rank one matrices. So this 
So, so yeah, I don't know how to say that. So, you know, maybe I'm just asking, how, so how, why, you know, why, why you can see that this is a rank N matrix, right? Using, you know, the rank one definition and the rank, you know, the rank N just means there are N summations of such rank one terms. Can you tell me more about how you can, um, you can write this M in terms of vector product, outer product? Um, okay, so, so this is indeed just a summation from one to N, sigma I, U I, B I transpose. Um, is this right? someone trying to join in? Okay. So first of all, I wanted to ask whether this is right. So is this correct? Can I write it in this form? Yes? Okay, um, let me see if people are okay with that. Uh, I cannot see you guys. Okay, so I'll assume that it's okay. Now, um, of course, as I said before, This can be written as the tensor product, okay? So we know this is a definition of a rank one matrix because it's written as a outer product of two vectors. So this is a rank one matrix, but you have in such summation of these rank one matrices. And that's why this thing is rank M, okay? Uh, rank N, right? So this is the matrix decomposition. Now we're going to the tensor one. So the tensor indeed can also be decomposed and you know it's actually written as something like this. This is exactly what I have on my slide. Okay, so this AH is just a vector, right? BH is a vector and CH is a vector. H is just the index you know, the denoting this is just a different vector. So, but overall, this is a vector. So you can see, I'm just, okay, I'm also, so one thing is I can just also try to, you know, somehow, even if I have a scaling factor here, I can just merge the scaling factor into one of these uh, vectors and that should be fine. So that's why I don't have a scaling factor here, down here for the X. Now you can see, um, this is a rank one tensor. And I have R such summation of these rank one tensors. So that's why this X is actually a rank R tensor. Okay. So this is so-called the CP decomposition. Okay. Um, so it seems like you cannot simply write it, uh, for example, here, like, you know, you cannot, you cannot simply write it in terms of this form, right? So even if you stack the A, so, you know, you can just say this is A1, A2, even if you stack the column vectors together to form these matrices, right? So you can do something like this. Uh, this is R, sorry. Right? So even you, you do something like that, you cannot simply write it in this form, right? You, ha you have to write it in terms of the vectors. There's no way that's very easy for you to write it in terms of 
these matrices or this matrix A, B, and C here. Oh, someone's asking what's the dimensionality of so X, A, B. So A, H is a vector in I, let's say, and B, H is a vector in J, C, H is a vector in K. So if that's the case, then I'm going to ask you, what's the dimensionality of X? What's it? I see someone say three. Um, so, 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 uh, yeah, that's a that's that's a very easy, you know, um, misunderstanding that you know you can think of. So three, so you know, the, when you say dimensionality, usually you mean the size. Three is the order. So I think that's something that's very easily we can, you know, misunderstand. But I think you know that, that you know the the size is just i by j by k. So this is just the third order tensor with size i by j by k. Okay. All right. So let me go back again. Okay. So now with that, I wanted to introduce another very important concept. Oh, am I not sharing? Uh, I am, right? Sorry, I'm just really confused to switch over. Uh, I think I am. Okay. So the multilinear transform is a very, very important concept in this, you know, in this class, maybe it's one of the most important slides uh, in today's lecture. So the multilinear operation is defined as the following. So if you have a tensor, right, which is written as, you know, the CP form, so is uh, AH tensor BH tensor CH. So each AH is just a vector, similarly BH and CH. So you're summing over H from one to R. So you have such a tensor, then a multilinear operation using matrices X, Y, Z is as follows. So X uh, is a matrix, Y is a matrix, and Z is also a matrix. So it is denoted as something like this, T, X, Y, Z, but sometimes people might have slightly different notations. I prefer to use this notation. So it's going to be defined as, um, so the summation of the X transpose AH. So what is this really doing? This is like, you know, this is my component for my first dimension. Let's say my, you know, um, column dimension. And this is my component for my row dimension. And this is the component for my third dimension. So I'm looking at a transformation on my first dimension component. And the transformation is through X. So that's why it's X transpose AH. So this is transforming AH through a linear operator. And the linear operator is just X. Okay, so it's a linear transformation of my first component. Well, that's not enough because I said this is a multilinear operation. So for the second order component, this is my BH, I will do transfer using my Y here. Similarly, for the third order moment uh, component, I will do a transfer using Z here. Okay, so overall, because I am doing linear transformation along each direction of my component, right? So then this is a multilinear operation. So I think by first introducing th this notation, it is easier to understand what multilinear operation is really doing. However, I haven't really introduced what a multilinear operation would do in terms of element-wise notation, okay? So what would a multidimensional uh, multilinear operation result in? For example, um, let's say X, so, so first of all, let's say the AH is, you know, again, 
uh, size of AH is I, size of BH is J, and size CH is K. So it's I, J, K. So the tensor will be I by J by K. So I'm going to first ask you if my X is, um, how should I say my dimensionality? Um, I'm going to think of a notation. Uh, I prime. So it's going to be I by I prime. Okay, so that's my dimensionality of my x. And my y is j by j prime. And my z is k by k prime. Okay, so these are the dimensions of my x, y, z. So I have a question for you guys. What would be the dimensionality of my resulting multilinear operation? So this tensor. What's the dimensionality of this guy? Right, again, you know, the dimensionality of AH is I, BH is J, CH is K, and the X is I by I prime, Y is J by J prime, and Z is K by K prime. Right? Exactly. It's going to be I prime by J prime by K prime. Why? Think about this guy first here. So if X is I by I prime and AH is just you know, dimension i, so what would this be? First of all, this would be a vector. And now the dimensionality of this vector is going to be i prime. Okay. And now here, similarly, this is going to be j prime, and this is going to be k prime. And that's why the dimensionality of this resulting tensor through this multilinear operation is going to be i prime by j prime by k prime. Okay. So that's, that's, that's easy to understand. Well, now I'm going to think about a special case. I'm thinking about a multilinear operation, not over x and y, z matrices, but over x, y, z vectors. OK, so these are just column vectors. So what does this mean? This means that I'm just, you know, inter of course, based on the, in you know, the definition above, I'm just going to replace the matrices with my vector. And this will become a inner product, right? dot product. You know, some of you might be more familiar with that. So it's going to be a dot product. So it's going to be x transpose ah. So what is the dimensionality here within this circle, or within this uh, parenthesis? One. Yeah, right? So it's a scalar, right? And this is also a scalar, and this is a scalar. Well, if it is a scalar, then you know the tensor product will give you also a scalar, right? So this thing will be a scalar. Okay, so it is a special tensor, of course. Even a scalar is a special tensor, but you know, just a scalar. Okay, so now actually. I'm going to ask the following question. So can you write T of X, Y, Z, the I, J, K element of that in terms of an element wise notation? So let me stop sharing. And again, going back to my iPad, sorry about the inconvenience. Okay, so I'm gonna ask, how do I write this thing? So we know that T of X, Y, Z, you know, is just H. Right, so we know this is the, the definition. So my question is, how do I write this? Okay, so what is the IJK element of that tensor? Hey, can someone tell me how? How to write this? So of course it depends on my tensor, right? So let's say it's depending on my tensor of. Um, actually, let me just use I prime here so that you don't get confused. Okay, so I prime, J prime, K prime's element. 
So it will depend on the IJK's element of my tensor. But now, what are the other elements? I think Michael had a very good point. So maybe we can start with the bilinear form. I think this will be much easier to understand, okay? So I'm just looking at a special case of this multilinear operation. Of course, this multilinear operation, you know, can be extended to second order linear, third order linear, and even multilinear, right? So now, now let's look at a bilinear form. So let's say you have a matrix M, right? So let's say this M can be written as a H B H right H from one to R. So this is a matrix, right? So this is apparently an I by J matrix. So now, you know, if you wanted to do this M of X, Y, actually, you know, so I will tell you what it is in a second. Based on the definition, it is actually X transpose A H, right? Tensor was Y transpose BH. Okay, so I'm gonna claim that this is equivalent as X transpose M, Y. And can someone see why? Okay, so if I write this out, X transpose M, Y, you will see, right? So I can try, write it as, Right? This is nothing but replacing the definition of the M here. So then you can see very obvious multiplied with, right? Sorry, transpose. Uh, okay, so maybe this is too fast. I'm going to write this way. So X transpose summation H from 1 to R, A H B H transpose Y. Do you agree? Because the, you know, for, for a tensor product between two vectors, so A H tensor B H is nothing but A H B H transpose. Okay, so now you can see this is very easy. So it becomes summation, right? Because X transpose is not related to H, so I can just plug in within the summation. So it becomes X transpose AH and BH transpose Y, okay? So now you can see this is what, if you think of this as a vector, think of this as a vector, then this will become X transpose AH tensor, Y transpose BH, right? So you can, so now this proves why this, um, you know, these are equivalent, okay? This is for a bilinear form. Is this clear? Okay, so now, you know, actually, I think this is a very good example to show you how to think of the element wise notation. So now I'm asking you, what is the I prime, J prime's element of this resulting matrix, right? So this bilinear operation. So this is equivalent as the I prime J prime element of the X transpose M Y matrix. Yes? Okay, so let me try to make sure we have space. So, so, so is this clear why this is equal? Because we've proved them. So, so now I'm going to ask, how do we write the I prime and J prime element of this X transpose M Y, right? It is nothing but summation over
Do you agree? Any questions or, you know, any objections? Think about it for a second. Is this correct? Yes? Oh, I cannot see you guys, so I cannot get a feedback. Hmm. Okay, but if nobody speaks up, I'm assuming that this is fine. Okay, so now from this, do you observe some kind of um, pattern here? Right? It seems that the pattern is pretty obvious. So now I'm claiming, so going back to this here, so I'm looking now here, right? Oh, shit, sorry. So then this will be summation of I, J, K, and I, J, K is element of the tensor multiplied with X, I, I primes element. So it's I, I primes element of the X and Y, J, J prime and Z, K, K prime. Okay, so this is actually the element wise notation for how you're getting the I prime, J prime, K prime element from a multilinear operation. Okay, once again, this is the result of the multilinear operation. It is a tensor. And now this I prime, J prime, K prime element of that tensor can be written in this form. So everything is an element, right? So this is a scalar because it's the I, J, K element of T is just scalar. I, I element of X is also a scalar. This is a scalar and this is a scalar. So it's a scalar multiplication, but you're summing over all I, J, K. So every possible values of combination, a combina every possible combinations of values of i, j, k. Okay, so, so hopefully using this bilinear transformation, we'll get an inspiration of why, you know, uh, this is the element was, you know, notation for the multilinear operation. Um, so I'm gonna pause for a second to wait for questions. Okay, if there's no question, I'll move on. Let me stop sharing here. Again, going back to, I don't know if this switching of the screen would uh, cause a problem in our video recording. I hope not. Okay. So let me bring back my spotlight. So, so again, you know, the motivation why I introduced tensor and introduced these, you know, higher order relationship is really to serve the purpose of doing uh, method moments and moment matching for higher order moments. So going back to that theme, wanted to understand tensors in method moments. I actually have already handed that very briefly, but now I wanted to formally introduce it. Right. So tensor is in method moments. So as I said, the matrix can be thought of as a pairwise relationship. But actually, I would think about it as a second order moment. It is a pairwise relationship. And the second order moment would be a matrix, right? So let's say first you have a signal or a data point, which is living in a you know uh, d-dimensional vector space. So the, you know, the, the number of attributes you have in the X or the number of elements in X is just D. So it's a vector with length D. Okay, so this is your one data observation here. Now, you know, looking at the pairwise relationship of itself, so it's gonna be X tensor X, right? So it's gonna be a matrix and the I, J element is, again, it's gonna be I element and the J element multiplied. So this will give you a rank one matrix 
for one element, uh, so, sorry, for one data point. So this is for the specific data point here. But now remember, we are looking at the aggregated pairwise relationship, right? So we look at the expectation of the pairwise relationship. We we'll look at empirical estimation of the expectation of the pairwise relationship. So this is aggregated pairwise relationship. And that's why, you know, the M2 or the second order moment is just the expectation of the XX transpose. And you can see the expectation is over the distribution of X. Okay. Is this clear? So this is going to be your second order moment. It will be a matrix and it's actually characterizing the pairwise relationship within the data. Okay, so pictorially, this is very similar to the tensor product we were introducing previously. I think this is easy to understand. And of course, you know, we can extend it to triple wise relationship or even higher. But in this example, we're looking at a triple wise relationship. And again, you're giving a data and you're giving a signal, which is living in the D dimensional vector space. So you have a rank one tensor getting from X tensor X tensor X. So this will be a rank one tensor and the IJK's element of that rank one tensor will be you know, the product of the I's element, J's element, the K's element of the signal, right, of the data. So that's how you're getting it. Again, you're getting the aggregated triple wise relationship. So you M, your third order moment, it's gonna be expectation of X tensor X tensor X. And it's going to be, you know, the simple notation you can just write as tensor power three. So this just means is a shorthand notation for this. Which again, it's just long, you know, notation. Okay, so you know, this is again the picture, a, a picture showing how you know you're looking at a triple wise relationship, and essentially you're looking at an aggregated triple wise relationship. So I think let's see if there is any questions. So if not, we'll move on. So now I'm going to introduce something that I think is very, again, a very interesting point that we might miss if we haven't thought about this very carefully. You know, we are all very familiar with matrix orthogonal decompositions. I'll introduce the, you know, the details later. But I'm going to introduce using this example to show why tensors are powerful or why tensors you know, are essentially sometimes more powerful than matrices. So let me show you this example using a matrix orthogonal decomposition. So matrix orthogonal decomposition is just that you're getting a decomposition of the matrix and the components are actually orthogonal to each other. So in this case, if you have uh, for, forget about this line first. Let, let's look at this example. You have an identity matrix, and this is like this simplest matrix, two by two. Okay, so you have an identity matrix two by two, and it can be written as E1, E1 transpose plus E2, E2 transpose. What is E1? E1 is just the one hot encoding, so it's just one zero, and one zero transpose is just like a row vector one zero. Now E2 is just zero one is again, like the second element of this one hot encoding, so it's zero, one, and E2 transpose is just a zero, one row vector. Okay, so if you calculate it, you can see this is exactly equivalent. So you know that E1 and E2 are orthogonal because one is one, zero, the other is zero, one. Definitely they're orthogonal because the, outer part, uh, the inner product is gonna be zero, right? So if, the, you know, so basically, E1 is orthogonal to E2, and this is called a matrix orthogonal decomposition. Okay, so you can think about this as the eigenvectors, and you know the eigenvalues are just going to be one and one here. Why? Because you know it's just one. Is you know this E1 has a norm one, and the E2 also has a norm one, so the eigenvalues are going to be one here. Both of these two components will have the same eigenvalue. So this is the so-called no eigenvalue gap because for this component E1, you have eigenvalue one. And for this component E2, you also have eigenvalue one. So you don't have eigenvalue gap, the gap is zero. Okay, so under this scenario, actually you will see, so pictorially, 
you know, if you think about E1, E2, and you can think about this picture here. So E1 is this direction and E2 is this direction, right? This is one zero and this is zero one. So now actually what's really interesting is because you don't have eigenvalue gap, you can essentially find any rotation of E1, E2. So for example, this U1 and U2 is just a minus 45 degree rotation of E1 and E2, right? So E1 is minus 45 degree rotation, so here. E2 minus, five, minus 45 degree notation is here, right? So this is just a rotation. Actually, you don't have to make it 45. It can be any degree of the rotation of E1 and E2, and it would actually become also eigenvectors for this identity matrix. As you can verify, this U1 is just this point here and U2 is this point here. You can verify that U1, U1 transpose plus U2, U2 transpose is also identity. So what is this saying? This is saying that if you don't have eigenvalue gap, like you know, the spectral of your matrix is not the most you know, um, desirable one, right? There is no eigenvalue gap. And, and you know you, you will be surprised even an identity matrix has this property and which is very surprising so you don't have unique matrix orthogonal decomposition why because you know you can decompose it in this form you can also decompose this in another form actually you can decompose it in infinite number of forms because any rotation of this e1 e2 vectors is going to be a valid solution so no unique matrix orthogonal decomposition without eigenvalue gap. So this is one drawback for, for this matrix orthogonal decomposition. Everyone thinks matrix orthogonal decomposition is really simple, right? And it's really powerful, but you know, because of this, you know, this example just shows you, you cannot even have a unique matrix orthogonal decomposition even for as simple as an identity matrix. Okay. So now, um, actually, you know, one thing, I, of course, I don't prove, I didn't prove here, but I just wanted to tell everyone that matrix orthogonal decomposition will be unique if you have an eigenvalue gap. Okay. So actually, so the reason why I'm talking about a unique decomposition is because um, something related to the moment matching. Remember, we have to solve these equations, right? We remember we have to solve these equations for moment matching, right? When f is just first order, so this will be a vector, right? Because x is a vector, so expectation of x is going to be a vector. Vector multi, you know, equivalent to a vector. So now f is x x transpose, a, you know, a second order. Then this will become a matrix, right? And then you know, doing moment matching, you would, you know, solve a matrix equ equation, right? The left hand side is a matrix. The right hand side is also a matrix. So actually, you actually need to do a matrix decomposition to solve for these theta. Um, I didn't have, you know, I, I cannot tell you why, but just keep that in mind. We'll explain it later. And actually, the reason why I'm talking about unique identifiability is that if you have a unique decomposition of this matrix decomposition, then you can have a unique identifiability of this theta. You can uniquely identify the model parameter. But you know, if your matrix decomposition does not have a unique answer, then you are in trouble, right? Because solving this equation, it can give you multiple possible ways of the uh, multiple pa possible values of the theta. So you not you cannot uniquely identify the model parameter theta. Okay. So. You know, I just wanted to give you an answer or give you an idea of why I'm talking about unique recovery or like a unique solution for matrix decomposition. Okay. So, but I'll, that will be more clear later on. I just wanted to give you an idea of why we're talking about those. So, you know, we talked about matrix orthogonal decomposition is, 
you know, not unique with eigenvalue gap. Actually, we're going to see this doesn't necessarily, it, it, this is no longer the scenario or this is no, no longer the constraint for tensor. So what's interesting is that even if you don't have eigenvalue gap, tensor orthogonal decomposition is always gonna be unique. Okay, so I will stop here today because I don't think I can finish talking about this term, but you know, um, I wanted to use the last three minutes to take questions. Is there any questions? <laughs> 